Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Andelin, Senior Workflow Specialist at SimActive. And today you're joining me for the webinar, When, Why, and How to Use RTK slash PPK in Photogrammetry. And with me today, I have David Alamillo. David, say hi. Hey, guys. How are you doing? David is also a photogrammetry specialist with us here at SimActive. So, um, David, give everybody a little bit of your background. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Well, um, my name is David Alamillo. I am based out of sunny California, and more specifically, Southern California. And well, very honored to be with you guys here today. Uh, a little bit about me and my background. Uh, interestingly, and this will amuse everyone, I have a background actually in business administration. And that's what I went to school for. I went to college, uh, always with a big focus on software technology. And, um, and that led me really to apply for jobs who were more in the technology space and the aerospace technology. Uh, I started working for a software development company back in 2014. And that's where really things started to kick off because this company wanted to open up a drone program. Back in the day, the you know, technology was, was fairly new. There were, there were some drones out, of course, but not a big amount of commercial drones out. So that was one of the tasks was, you know, you have to do the budget, you have to look into purchasing the drone. And then second of all, what are we going to do with the imagery we get and how do we process that imagery? So that involved a lot of meetings with developers and figuring out the best way and the best drones in the industry. Of course, that opened the doors to this uh, today, working with amazing people. Uh, shout out to my colleague, Shane Meldy. Uh, learning a lot from every single one in the industry and uh, most importantly, learning about different platforms and, and how we process data, how data becomes useful. Uh, sometimes wasting a lot of time in the field when things go, don't go the right way and having to go back into the field and reprocess data because of mistakes that were made. Wow. So a lot of learning throughout this, um, these years, it's been now a little bit over a decade now. So it's, um, uh it's been great it's been really really good uh a little bit on the side um big uh, fan of star wars i enjoy watching every single show on disney plus um ourselves in the office we're pretty big fans too so we're always chatting about the brand new thing in the show and you know um kicking it off with master yoda <laughs> so really really big fan of course in the background you might see some some toys i'll give you guys a little little uh, clear view here, Eric. Uh, these are basically toys from back in the 80s. Uh, they're Japanese anime toys. And they were they were out when I was not, not even born yet. But I was, uh, started watching the shows when I was growing up. And so hard to get these toys all the way back in Japan. So little by little, I'll be making up the collection. And now I have over 67. So uh, that's something if you guys come to my office, you'll see I have pretty much toys everywhere and Lego sets and whatnot. Big fan of that. Very but, cool. And that's about me. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Um, you didn't know this, but I also have a master's in business. So even though I have a military <laughs> background, wow. yeah, I have a military background in serving and a family background in aerial photography and mapping. I actually got my master's yes. in business as well. So, and I grew up in Southern California and instead of toys, I collect bicycles, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're pretty we're, close there. So, <laughs> we're pretty close there. Yeah. We're twins. We're twins, just from different countries. <laughs> right. So so for the audience, you know, um, what I've been doing is, you know, as David said, he's, he's coming from the drone side of things. And, and my background goes a little bit farther back than that because I'm a bit older. Um, so I'm helping David with the, the, the conversion over to aerial photography, aircraft, large format, and all of that was actually... It's kind of easier um, than dealing with the issues that you have with drones and David deals with issues that you have with drones all the time. So we appreciate that. But today we're going to talk about, you know, RTK and PPK. So we're getting into survey and I'm going to tell you right now, I, I have a background in surveying. I'm not a surveyor. I did not get my license as a surveyor. Why would I want to be out there in the bush when I don't have to be? Um, so I, I, I appreciate what those people do and that's not me. But um, to some degree, we can talk about it. We have to understand it to to be able to do photogrammetry and follow that technology. And you know, again, 
RTK, PPK, um, you know, whatever, whichever version you want to work with, photogrammetry has been around way before any of those things were involved. But that's not to say we don't want to capitalize on the technology that we have, especially in, in the drone market where we can do that. So we, we've got some slides and I'll, and I'll be popping these up as we talk. So the yeah, first sure. thing we're going to look at is, you know, um, how long GPS has been around in a usable format for, for mapping. And uh, he, David saw the slide and he's like, oh, 1953, geez, uh, that's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, interesting yeah. fact, I mean, it started with Sputnik. It started way back when the Soviets, you know, uh, threw the dog up in Venus. the air. Yeah, the, the yeah. dog's name was Laika. That's not bonus points, but that's, that's his name. And ironically, if you ever get to go to St. Petersburg, Russia, which I don't think anybody will get to go to anymore. I did that right, for my 50th soon. birthday, and I did go to the Russian Space Museum. That was really oh, cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was really cool. I saw their, I saw their fake shuttle. Um, I saw the, the, the Sputnik capsule, the recreation of it, um, all the history wow. of the dogs and all that. So it was really cool. But... You know, that wasn't the, originally the intent of all that. That was just to, you know, get up and dominate space. Um, since sure. then, you know, um, we started looking at, you know, how do we use that in, in the world of positioning and, and, you know, jump in if you have any, you know, comments here. But, you know, we, it starts really with like the Navstar systems in the 70s. And then, yep. uh, you know, then, you know, the military starts looking at it as, as a way to you know, isolate yep. where their bombs are going to hit and things like that. Um, and then it became a practical reality for the commercial market over time to the point now where, you know, we all have it on our cell phones. We all have that capability. Even the survey market has begun using, um, you know, GPS uh, to help with positioning. It's in, in aerial mapping. It's been an airborne GPS in large format aircraft since mm, probably the late 80s um yep. early 90s true um and you know it works really well up there because you're way up there with a the satellite so you have you know very little um interference and things like that so um it helps out in the drone world there's some more challenges and i'll let david jump in on that but um the differences between rtk and ppk do you want to jump in on that one sure and you know even even going back to the gps point of things uh it's funny how it's embedded now in our culture today, right? Uh, uh, my daughter, she's 13 years old, and the other day she was asking me, what's the accuracy of actually that blue point on the map? Yeah. And I go around a class of GPS and say, well, let me explain to you about the satellites. And, and she gets all worked up and says, okay, I don't want to know too much about satellites and positioning, but yeah. how accurate is it? And, uh, and that was just amusing at how we use GPS for everything today. Uh, I don't know about you, Eric, but I hop on the car and I have to turn on that GPS because I'll get lost pretty quick. Yep. My wife is so much faster to get somewhere and I'm so distracted. But yes, GPS saved uh, tons of lives now and it's embedded in everything we do. But going back to how accurate things are, that's where we get into what we call RTK, uh, real time kinematics. And something that is embedded in the word is real time. Yep. And we'll see the differences between the different techniques and technologies today. But yes, uh, real time kinematics will basically improve the position of our GNSS receivers, right? Uh, and when we talk about global navigation satellite systems, um, we, we basically want to be as accurate as possible. And, you know, it becomes addicting. When you start seeing the accuracies that you can get with some of these systems, you're like, whoa. Or at least to start reading the brochure and what they promise on how accurate you can be. Yep. You think you're going to be sub centimeter in a day. Of course, there's so many more things involved in that. Yep. But um, real RTK is a technique that has been used now for a long time on improving the accuracies. Um, you know, it basically allows us to measure, you know, your position with way more precision and more accuracy. And, you know, We'll have a lot of surveyors watching us, but one of the main things you guys know is you have a second receiver in order to accomplish this, which is your other GNSS receiver, your base and your rover. And you have basically these guys on the field collecting data. And then uh, one of the things that I try to explain to my daughter is the corrections that are done and the different atmospheric, you know, uh, yep. of course, errors that we get in the, in the two receivers are actually fixing that. 
in order to improve our overall accuracy. So in lame terms, I tell her, you know, that's basically how you get that accurate in data that, you know, we, we process now through v VRTK. Um, I probably oversimplified it a bit, but I don't know if you have any other comments regarding that. Yeah, yeah um, well, one, I always, always forget to do this, so I'm gonna get back to it. What you will learn in this webinar, the differences between RTK and PPK. So uh, we talked about RT RTK a little bit. We'll talk about the differences. Factors that impact ac accuracy. I mentioned that a little bit. We'll go into more detail. Sure. Processing options in Correlator 3D. You know, some comments about when to use RTK um, and or PPK. And then, you know, finally some troubleshooting that you might, you know, you, you see a value that doesn't look yeah. right or you see something way off there's some ways to troubleshoot that using the software. You know, again, back to RTK, you talked about a base and a rover. In, in drones, that rover is the drone. Instead right. of the person walking around and taking spot shots in, out in that field, um, you know, where the rover is connected to the base and the base is, is soaking in the satellite information, um, now that rover is the drone and, and it's up there and it's, it's capturing, you've got your base, which is set over a known point in, you know, soaking up that GPS data, the satellite data, and you've got a rover over here capturing that information as well. And they're communicating to each other and it's making those connections. Again, as long as there's a connection between the, the satellite, the base receiver and the receiver on the drone and the telemetry system that the drone is working with, whether that's a, you know, a person with a controller or what have you, as long as yep. that, communication loop is there, you're going to get very, very accurate positional data on the drone as it's flying, from which you can also then uh, either geotag or create an XF file um, of each exposure uh, so that you can use that to get a more precise starting point in your processing. So if we think about just basic GPS being, you know, plus or minus 10 meters, you know, it's just a big bubble, yep. um, you know, plus or minus 10 meter accuracy, that, that's fine, um, that works. But um, if we're talking about a real time correction, now we're talking about in the centimeters, maybe even sub centimeter, depending on, you know, other conditions. Um, so yes. that's RTK in a nutshell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, some people say, that's why you're not a surveyor, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and you know what? Uh, reading the brochures, I have to say, they promise you, uh, of course, whatever product you're using today, one of the most popular ones out, you know, they're not as expensive as others, but they promise you always this level of accuracy. And it doesn't matter. I've, I've, I've worked with surveyors. I've worked with, you know, like I said, through the industry, learning about, you know, um, great guys with great knowledge and photogrammetry and 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 sometimes they've been fooled by the by the label on the on the drone and the system and say well this thing promised me that i would mm -hmm. get this level of accuracy mm -hmm. and once we're out in the field they discovered that there's so many other factors and we're going to touch base on some of those that you know they bump into and they realize that it's not what they actually advertise sometimes in the box right absolutely and yeah that's That'd be a whole nother, whole nother conversation. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, going back, so we've got RTK. We've, we've talked about that. You have to have a base, a rover, a connection between, between uh, those things so that they can all communicate uh, real time and make those corrections. PPK is a little bit different. PPK, your base doesn't have to be on site you're actually interacting directly with the satellite, the, the satellite constellation um, in the unit in the drone. And sometimes it's, it's two of them, an L1 and L2, or you know, two yeah. channels. And the corrections are, are actually, the, where your base technically is, is on a network. Um, it could be a core station, it could be a privately owned station, like I think in Texas they have a privately owned station that maybe Trimble sets it up, I'm not sure, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, but um, there is a, a connection um, there. Now, the difference is, is that if you fly the drone, land it, you've been connected to PPK, and you turn around and you start processing, you're going to get good data. 
if you let the, the system correct itself over a period of days, then you're gonna get what's called the ephemeris data, which is yes. basically much more accurate, probably even more accurate than RTK. So one of the trade-offs is, is that you have to wait for that data. So, Leave it collected. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have to wait for yeah. that data. Whereas with RTK, you don't. But with RTK, if that, if that connection drops, in any of the situation between the drone and the receiver, uh, you're dead in the water. You, your data set, you're, you're pretty much, you've lost your XYZ. So you, you, what you're hoping is that, you know, whatever your drone is still is collecting basic GPS so that you can go back to that plus or minus, you know, 10 meter bubble of XYZ accuracy. Again, nothing wrong with that. But really that's the difference between the two. Correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think I nailed that as best I can. Perfect. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, I learned this the hard way on differences on what would I use for a particular job, either using RTK versus PPK. Mm -hmm. uh, once I was exposed to PPK and, and the technology and the advantages of it, I have to say today, Eric, I was a little more inclined of using PPK. Mm -hmm. I actually preferred it over RTK because you mentioned something very important, which was drop signals. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, I'll, I'll, one particular job, the signal dropped. I did a firmware update right before I went to do the job. And unfortunately, every time you do firmware updates, either you know on your controller, depending on the craft, you might have issues when you're out in the field. And that's exactly what happened. Well, and let's now, and of course, another thing about drop signals, <laughs> uh, another thing about drop signals, you tip your wing with enough angle, you know, all of a sudden yeah. you've dropped that signal. And you know, yes. now you've got junk until the two connect again. So sometimes you can yeah, sometimes right. you can be aware of it and say, okay, I dropped the signal and I'll just sit there and I'll circle for a while until I like, catch there back up. But what a pain, what a pain that can be. So what a pain, yeah. absolutely. Uh, baselines of course play into that, um, you know, uh, having a greater baseline when you're using a PPK system, one of the advantages of it. Uh, and that's what, also one of the main reasons of, um, I just liked PPK better than RTK. Uh, in my personal experience, I, most of the missions that I had to fly back in the day was I had to process them myself. So I didn't put the stress on anyone else. I had to come to the office and, and deal with the issues of what I collected in the field. Yeah. So that, I used to mention, that was a big pain. And um, yeah, overall, that was one of the main, the main uh, reasons why I prefer PPK in a nutshell. But yeah. yeah, very well said. You know, it's almost it's it's almost like a a a level of graduation for people. They start off with, in the <laughs> case of drones, they might start off with just a a, a Phantom Four, and it's just capturing you know your basic GPS. Yeah. Um, then you, then you pay yeah. up to an RTK version, and now you now you've got to get survey equipment, so your investment goes way up. Um, Technically, you should not be surveying unless you're a surveyor. So, um, sure. you know, uh, we always espouse that, but we know there are people, especially in the drone world, that are not necessarily doing that. Um, yes. You know, but again, that your investment cost goes up quite a bit once you go to RTK because you have to have that additional survey equipment and really you should have that knowledge. Um, when you step up to PPK, it's almost like your scientific knowledge has to go up. Um, because <laughs> it really does. Yes. the principles are the same, but how you get the best result out of that takes, takes a bit of work. Um, it's a workflow and you follow steps and you get through it, but you know, you have to understand it in your head, how you're doing that. So again, if you've got survey background or you are a surveyor, you get that. Um, if, if you come completely from out of this market, um, of mapping or out of this, you know, group of mapping, then you yes. really have to become educated in that, you know, in, in, in all of those aspects. So with that, let's, I mean, let's talk about factors that impact accuracy. And we're only talking about surveying in this part or the surveying portion of what we're doing with a drone. I guess I'm a technologist. Um, when new technology comes out, no matter what it is, I'm usually involved in it when it is related to geospatial. So for example, when the first mobile LIDAR systems came out, I was working with mobile LIDAR and setting those, pro uh, those programs up within companies. And the big yes. challenge with mobile LIDAR was 
you, how do you maintain your lock while you're collecting all this data with high, you know, high dollar IMUs and high dollar lasers, but you still need to, to maintain your lock. And that has a lot yeah. to do with the positions of the satellites, you know, what's obstructing their views, you know, your PDOP and things like that, and your HDOP and your GDOP and all that. And you end up spending a lot of time in your Trimble Business Center or whatever you're working with, you know, <laughs> figuring out what days or what hours we can fly these, in this case, drive, but we can work on these projects. And it's the same way if you're looking for the best data sets, you have to be able to look ahead and say, what's coming? What might be causing me to drop signal? Uh, as you yes. said, it may not be a firmware, but you may be thinking, hey, everything is right. What is going on? Oh, well, GPS is down. <laughs> you know, yep. you have to be aware of that. Drop signals. Uh, distance from your base. That's a huge thing, especially in the RTK world. The farther you are away from that base, you know, the more likely you're going to either drop that signal or something like that. Again, in PPK, it's, it's kind of similar. You want to have a base as close as possible. You don't necessarily sure. get that opportunity. You know, but again, there's there's some research to be done. Where's the nearest one? Uh, how do I connect to it? What's my backup? Things like that. Um, exactly. I know one of the arguments in the drone world is is that well, I can get you the data faster. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that argument. that's fine. Um, but there are some things that will hogtie you, and if you're doing something like a PPK solution, that may be one of those things you might you know might want to consider, but. No, you nailed it. I think uh, a poor PDOP is one of the main reasons uh, that I started researching a little bit more on exactly how that affected, you know, uh, my collection out in the field. Uh, and like I said, I'm a little nerd when it comes to that, you know, position of satellites and how they work and, and how that geometry will affect the overall solution and, uh, and the values that we have to take in consideration. So as you're right, sometimes it can be a little bit more intricate. It's just, you know, I did a firmware update and now I lost connection out in the field and I'm doomed. And in some cases also, well, new, new technologies give you the option of pausing the mission, as you mentioned earlier, while you reconnect, uh, which is amazing. Uh, but in some cases, you don't even realize it until you're done with the mission. Right. And in those cases, yeah, it's, it, they're big headaches, uh, really, really big headaches. So absolutely, I agree 100% with everything uh, that we're discussing today. I think uh, the more you realize, and like you mentioned, how how many factors could be involved in getting a good solution and not a good solution, it really goes more than just mission planning. Yeah. Um, uh, pretty much that's the beginning of it, but it, it really gets into the weeds of seeing you know, best time of day and, and having a very strong mission before you head out into the field mm -hmm. and decide to collect this this job for a client or for whatever purpose you need it. Yep, yep. Um, I remember one of the things, I'm, I, I'll pull up the slide here. Um, sure. That that always drove, uh, drove us crazy because here in Florida, especially, <laughs> um, you know, we, we have, like we would be out, you know, doing a, a corridor, uh, you know, a road corridor or something like that. And we've got, sure. you know, we've got pine trees on both sides of us, you know, <laughs> less than less than 50 meters out, um, you know, going up 100 feet. And you get multipath problems all the time, which is basically that satellite signal hitting something and then, yes. you know, bursting uh, out and, you know, just basically wrecking that signal as it's coming. Uh, into your receiver or bouncing off something else and coming in from two directions and confusing the heck out of it. So there are all, sure. there's always things that you have to be aware of. So your project planning becomes um, very important uh, when you're doing things where you're working with RTK and PPK. It's, you know, you, you certainly have to be aware. You certainly have to be aware of where your clear spots are, the times that you need to fly, um, you know, when GPS is down, you know, we're, we, we're near NASA, so they'll do crazy things every once in a while and shut things down. Here in Florida. So, yeah, yeah. So you have to be aware of that. So, um, Absolutely. and then, you know, on a, on a, a larger scale, um, we're, we're only talking about XYZ position at this point. So we're just talking about what's, how tight can we get that position? of the aircraft in the air when that exposure is taken. Um, that does not take into effect um, 
your your um, Omega Kappa Phi. It's only taken into effect sure. roll pitch and yaw. So unless you have a really really expensive IMU, and I'm not <laughs> talking about just some little bitty IMU, it needs to say a Planix or Novotel on it. Unless you have a really expensive IMU, you're still missing part of the solution. And then yes. Again, and I harp about this in, in our webinars, but unless you have a really good calibrated, calibrated metric camera, you're missing another part of that solution. So, you know, thankfully, uh, that's what we have software for um, to solve for those other things. So um, just like we can solve uh, or we can do a calibration on the camera in Correlator 3D, we can also solve for some of the issues like Omega Kappa Phi, we can also solve for the issues of, of poor GPS. So, um, yes. you know, there are ways to, to analyze your data, find out where the problems are, make the corrections. And um, that's, that's where we're headed next. Where I want to look at things is how we set up projects in Correlator 3D um, and how we would set it up specifically, say, for RTK or PPK. So, um, you know, again, I, I popped up a couple slides. Um, one of them here just talks about the different settings in, in AT. So what you might use to get that solution that you're looking for. So for example, I just got a slide up so you, you know, I want you to see it, but full AT constrained means that you're constraining yep. all the parameters. You're either constraining the, uh, the position of the image in the air or you're constraining the Omega Kappa Phi, or you're constraining the camera. You're saying, yes. software, don't mess with this. It's good, I believe <laughs> it, process the data. And then uh, we have full AT unconstrained, which means I'm, you know, I'm not super confident in any yes. of these values coming from the aircraft or from the positioning system, let the software solve it. And where full AT unconstrained really comes in great is if you've got control. Because if you've got control, we can solve everything else. And then yeah. you have um, what we have now renamed RTK PPK assisted, which what it's doing is it's constraining the XYZ, but it's letting everything else float so the software can fix it. <laughs> if you guys just mentioned that? something really important. <laughs> yes, I, I have to pause you right there because this is the million dollar question. I'm flying RTK PPK. Do I need control? <laughs> it should be a question. I love you stuff. need control. You always need control. And you know, let's yes. go back. To, let's go back to RTK real quick. If you've already yep. spent money on survey equipment and you're already out there surveying, why aren't you just collecting control? You know, that's yeah. just something to consider. Uh, but you know, a couple of points won't hurt. No. And for me, it was a little walk in setting up my control that definitely helps. I know you don't need that help because you're on that bike that every day, yep. but me, that walk sitting up control really helped out. Yep. <laughs> I kind of miss it now, but certainly control is something very important. I can't stress the fact that how many times I tell my customers, if you're out in the field, you have those controls in the back of your truck, you have the equipment, as you mentioned, yep. shoot them out. Yep. You can use them as checkpoints and we'll look at it in correlator and the benefits of how correlator deals with how we import our checkpoints and GTPs and how we can manage them you know, on the fly and make these adjustments. Uh, but in some cases it will save your life. And I have to say it saved mine a couple of times when I had to, when I forgot to really check my RTK was running and I had to go back into the office and use my handy dandy GCPs to tighten everything up and there have a go. viable solution. There you go. So, you know, with that, let's, let's pop over into the demo side of things. You can share screens right now, or do you need me to turn it over? Sure. Now it's all yours. Awesome. Well, yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely start off with setting up your project in Correlator. Um, I have to say, I mentioned earlier, right at the beginning of the call, learning new technologies, learning new software. Uh, one of the things that wasn't trusted was find a software that can process all these images that we collect out in the field. And uh, went through so many options, had to learn so many. Did, you know, it gave people a lot of headaches on questions that probably were very obvious now that I look back. But at the time I was learning the process and just reading everything I could in the manuals. So that's where I really started. Uh, and something that I really liked about Correlator right off the bat, it's how well organized it is. And, and really how easy it is to complete your process by just importing the images and then following uh, what we call modules. 
uh, and I'll just give everyone a brief orientation. The series of icons here on your top bar will be your modules. Like any module, you can turn it on and off. A couple of modules will give you additional tools to interact with the data, like editing the data. See those little pencils here, those are edit modules. Um, but it's really simple on how you can start off a project by clicking you know, the first icon there, which will bring up the different types of licenses and correlator. Um, and we'll, we're gonna set up a project here live, so we're gonna focus on the UAV one. Uh, of course, bring in uh, our images, we only have one camera. So let's go ahead and add some files. And I have a couple of images here. We won't import the entire project, but I think there's around 1,000 images. Uh, we'll just do a couple here to get forward to the screens. Uh, one important thing is you get your orientation parameters. We were talking about that. Um, you get your long, lat altitude, roll pitch and yaw. It's embedded in your EXIF data. You always have the option to bring in an exterior EO file so you can browse for that if need be and then import it and work through the different um, options you have on the drop down menu. Very important, uh, selecting your projection system. This is something that um, I always ask customers, what is your output projection? What projection system you're working? And um, something that I like is, of course, you have your common systems where you can drop down the menus and then select the appropriate one if you work through the menus. Or, you know, the EPSG code, type in that PPSG code in here, and then you are ready to go. Actually, shout out to our buddy, Chris Green from Bullseye Construction. He was able to provide us a demo data set that we could uh, spin around today for you guys. So uh, thank you, Chris. Appreciate thank you, it. Chris. And actually, he threw me a curveball there, Eric. Um, he sent me a message and said, hey, I, I, had a, I had a bad control in there. Were you able to find it? And I was like, was that part of the webinar? Were you testing me? <laughs> and uh, yes, we, we, we caught it uh, and we we're able to, to take that one out. Again, I'll show you guys a little bit of what we did. Anyway, back to the image selection. Once we have our, our total image count here, 56 images, we get confirmation for a projection, our images and the dimension of the image. Uh, we can simply hit next. And where I'm gonna do a little pause here, Eric, is, is this portion right here. Uh, sometimes it's ignored because we typically, you know, fill in the values for the sensor. Yes. Uh, which is your image width, height, focal length, and pixel size. However, you mentioned something that's very useful, and we'll come back to this uh, once we start talking about exporting our, our calibration file. But our radial distortion, uh, distortion para parameters and your, our decentering parameters. We have the ability to import a calibration file from this point. Uh, it, and in this case, for example, uh, if I generated this in correlator, uh, the format that we export this is a CAM file. So you guys can see if I open that, it will automatically fill in all my uh, radial distortion parameters and my P's as well. So something very useful. And again, once I have a very strong solution, I feel comfortable with the calibration done to the sensor. I can import this for all my future missions. So something. Right. So what, what you mean easy. though? What, what you mean though is once you're confident and you've got a good solution from that specific camera, you can export it and save it as a camera cal file, and then you can use it on other projects. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's something that we did with Chris in particular. You know, talking about this data set, and um, I recommend most of our customers to do uh, once they hit this this part of the workflow. Really saves a lot of time. Now, of course, you don't have to do it. It's not necessary. Of course, if we don't have one, we, we, we basically move on with the same values that we had initially, and it will let us continue. Finally, selecting your project folder and a confirmation of your projection. Something very important that I always make note is, <laughs> I used to make this mistake all the time, is setting up my project folder on an external drive, Eric, and then for some reason, I disconnected this drive. I couldn't find the drive, and my project was nowhere to be found. Yep. Uh, yeah, I always make the recommendation you have a good SSD drive in your machine or need to install a new one, make sure it's in your local drive and you know it won't go anywhere. And you know, it will be a faster process when you're doing your orthos and your 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 mosaic process. So that will right. just increase your speed. So here we can just hit finish and it will load up our project. Uh, of course, I have this project already loaded um, here on, on one of our processing machines. And this is how it would look once you import it. 
Uh, so as you guys can see, the setup of the project was really, really fast. Uh, it doesn't take much information, uh, but I have a quick recommendation here, Rick, when, when uh, dealing with accuracies. And if, if I have a job that is 5,000 images and I'm uncertain if my, if my actually I'm going to get good results and good accuracy from this job, uh, whatever the project might be, I always recommend starting small. Rather than doing your test on a 5,000, 1,000 image project, you can simplify your project into a couple of images, run your tests, and see how good of an accuracy you're getting or results. Absolutely. I, I we, completely concur with that. And um, and this is something that, you know, I, I always remind our folks there uh, when we're doing the demos and trainings because um, this, this is a, you know, maybe a 2,000 image job, but I'm just going to test how accurate my results came in. So one of the things you can do if you're importing the 1,000 images is you can disable the images uh, directly from um, the GUI. So if you allow me, I'll show that part and just remind our folks how to do that. And we'll move on to the different modules that we have here on the top bar. And the one that we're going to be focusing today will be, as uh, Eric mentioned earlier, is our aerial triangulation module. And I like to say that this is where the magic happens. This is where everything gets set up and where everything looks either terrible or perfect. So once we open up the, uh, the module, you guys will see we have a series of tools here on your left-hand side. And uh, please ignore right now my, my processing. I'm gonna go back into my initial step. So you can see I, it's, a, it's a larger project and I simply took a portion of it so it's very simple to set up in a way that you have tools to remove images or adjust flight lines depending on what you want to process. As I mentioned before, if, if it's something you just need to test, you can always come into the editor and select uh, the tools uh, the tool here on the top left hand corner and select what images you want to delete from the solution. Once you have made that selection, you simply confirm by clicking uh, the plane uh, with the pencil and it will confirm selection and automatically disable those images. Uh, one quick note about that is, do my images disappear? Are they deleted from my root folder? No, they're still there. Don't worry, guys. It will only disable them from the solution. They won't delete them from your hard drive. Um, so this is one option that we have in the AT. Of course, we'll go through the different options that we have. Uh, something that you guys saw earlier in the screens was our bundle adjustment. Uh, if I had to rank our, our tools, bundle adjustment is where I spend the most time. <laughs> yes. Doing processing, doing adjustments, uh, going back and forth. And I'm, I'm something I love about, about Correlator is how flexible our bundle adjustments are and how easy it is for me to delete the step that was not probably giving me good results and rerunning that in a different mode. So we're gonna be looking at that here in a minute. One thing that I wanna point out is, of course you guys can see here, I already done most, most of my steps, but if I go back here on the left-hand side, you guys can see my steps here on the, on the project tree. Uh, I removed a couple of images, then I ran my type point extraction and, um, and the type point extraction look, they look pretty good. Um, and typically you have options there. That would be the first step right after you clean up your images the software will always prompt you to do this uh, of course if you want to go manual on this you can come in here and then select this option which is extract your tie points and you will have options there to do it you know either uh, standard or exhaustive depending on the nature of the data uh, finally the one i want to get to this is rtk data uh, and uh, i want to go back to our uh, bundle adjustment screen yeah and here's where I want to show you guys a couple of the options that we have. Um, of course, if I was coming into the job, it's RTK PPK assisted. This is the option I would select. And as uh, Eric really pointed out, it's I always advise our customers to use this option when they know their GPS data is accurate. Um, I, uh, of course, you can go ahead and test it and see what the results are. But in some cases, uh, the data either for whatever reasons, the many reasons we already pointed out is not giving us a strong solution, an accurate solution. We actually see things that are not working the way they should or the accuracies, the accuracies that we need. We imported our checkpoints. We can always uh, default back, like as I mentioned before, to our GCPs. 
So in this case, I ran this as an RTK PPK assisted, um, use unconstrained first sensor calibration. And then if I check it, I have checkpoints. If I've imported my checkpoints, I can run it with checkpoints or not if I don't have any type of checkpoints in the field. So I can process and then I'll basically get what you guys are seeing right now, which is what I got. And it doesn't look great. Of course, I talked to Chris about this data set and we had some issues obviously with the RTK system. And uh, that was one of the things that he said, you know, I, I was aware this is a bad data set. I, di I didn't have a strong solutions. The accuracies were very bad. So one of the things he said, what are my options, Eric? What can I do with this data set? It's not looking good. My accuracies are all over the place. So what we recommend then I said, Chris, did you collect GCPs out in, in, out in the field? He's like, yes, I shot my GCPs. I have everything in there. What can we do? I told him, let's go back one step. So well, typically what we would do is delete the step that we did previously. So I would come in here and delete that step automatically. And I would come and that would basically delete the last uh, bundle adjustment that I did on my images, come and perform a bundle adjustment and rather than going my typical RTK PPK assisted, because I know for a fact that this data, the GPS data is not accurate, I am going to let the software do run, run its magic. And I'm going to go for a full ATM constraint, which as Eric mentioned uh, earlier, this will allow the software to do all the necessary parameter allocations. It will let you do, you know, basically all the work for you. Let's put it simple and plain. Let me, and, and let me just make it, let me simplify it for sure. people. Um, here's a way to look at it. If you're doing it um, constrained or RTK PPK, PPK assisted, what you're saying is, is that the image positions in the air are correct and therefore create a solution for me that gives me ground. So consider it a top down pyramid. I'm building that ground from the top down with, with a solution that may not be that good. Now, instead of doing that, if you've got control, and this is why we say you need control, if you've got control, yes. you can do it full AT unconstrained, which means the software is going to build it from the control back up to create those positions in the air. So look, think of it one of two ways. It's either it's either RTK PPK assisted and it's a pyramid going down or it's it's unconstrained and it's a pyramid going up. So you can correct for those points. Thank you. Yep. Very good explanation. Absolutely. And one of the things that surprised Chris was the options we had embedded in the software and how easy it was to transition between one or the other. I think that was the main thing for him that, that, that was surprised. He really thought he needed to create a new project, redo the entire import. And that was something that was very um, easy for him to understand and say, okay, I can simply open my, delete my last step, run my bundle adjustment with a different setting. It will produce better results. And we said, yes. Now, something that, of course, will change here, of course, if you're running your RTK, you're typically going to running GCPs, but you have a series of checkpoints, as you guys can see here on the left-hand side. So something that we, we, we did was go to each checkpoint and update it to be a GCP. Uh, he said, do I have to remeasure all my GCPs and spend you know, all this time redoing all this work? No, actually, no. We can simply come in here and edit. There we go. Awesome. So now that we have um, we have loaded our GCPs, our checkpoints, um, you guys, I will show you how to update those from a checkpoint to a GCP. You guys, we uh, we have all our measurements, so you guys can see basically all all the measurements we've done to those GCPs. But we'll drop down the menu. It's the first little tab, and we'll update the type. And you guys can see we have a couple of options there. If I'm uncertain about my, my Z and I'm not very comfortable on how it was measured, I can only bring them in as X, Y, and that's perfectly fine. On the contrary, if I only want to measure Z, I can do that, update just to measure Z and update this GCP to just have Z. But in this case, we're going to use them as full-on GCPs, X, Y, Z, save and close, and that will automatically put it now on the section of GCPs. So we'll do that for every single one and we'll basically update every single checkpoint and then adjust our bundle adjustment. Um, now, of course, I, I have this project completed and I'll show you guys the results of what we got from GCP. So 
if you guys allow me, I'll, I'll turn this off and I'll show you the full extent of the project. Uh, we have it right here. And there we go. So we go back to our AT module. Um, we'll see the steps. Basically, the only thing that was done now is, of course, I'm doing the entire project now because I know that I'm going to be running it um, with unconstrained using my GCP. So I have a series of GCPs here. And, um, and each one you can see is on the GCP section. I moved them from checkpoints to GCPs. I would, once that step is done, I would come in, do my full AT unconstrained, sensor calibration unconstrained, and bring in as ground control points right. and process. Very simple, very easy to do. Again, I'm working within the same project, just simply updating um, the methodology of how I run my AT and my bundle adjustment. This will, of course, give you guys a report when you guys can see, you know, all the way down from your ground control points, your RMSC errors, XY errors, but down to your tie points. So again, pretty simple, uh, but again, pretty powerful at the same time on how you can, you know, run your different type of bundle adjustments. And, and something that I'll add here is, is, is there a limit to how many bundle adjustments I can do? Uh, the answer is really no. Uh, you guys can keep refining that solution. Uh, just to keep my project clean, I tend to delete a step that I didn't use. So I come in here and if a step gave me bad results, I come in and, and, and I simply, uh, you guys can hover over the step and remove the step yeah. and then rerun. So just to keep my project clean, but once I'm running, you know, in, in, in uh, unconstrained, I can keep refining that, remeasure my GCPs if need be. And then if you allow me, Eric, the final part that we talked about was I like the accuracy from this project. I like the, basically the calibration that was done on the sensor. I want to export uh, my calibration file. And the, the, the way to do this will be go to file, uh, EO and camera and do your text file. And simply select the folder and it will generate that file that we saw earlier upon import, which is, was the .cam file. And uh, again, that can be used on my next mission. Um, so on and so forth. Yeah, and it, just you know, for people's knowledge, the, the EO file that it exports, um, if you were working in, say, a stereo environment in um, another software, you could use those EOs to position your images um, kind of like on the fly. The, the, the AT is already done, so you could bring those EO files in and um, start setting up your projects in stereo and do your extraction if you wanted to. Um, but the, well, the one thing I wanted to bring up, though, is uh as a last thing again if you're if you're using rtk or ppk and you bring in your solution and as as we looked back at that at that initial solution we could see that some of the images were green on the on on the screen some were yellow maybe some were red it's color coded to tell you what the error is so if you start to see um, unlike this data set where full AT unconstrained, every, all the images were displayed in green, that's on point. That's less than a pixel. Um, if you start to see them in yellow, they could be getting into the pixel range. And you can see again on the, on the left there. So that right there is one way to QC what's going on. If you start to see a bunch of yellow, you can say, hey, something's not good with my results up here. And if you ran RTK PPK assisted or full AT constrained, the only thing that's not good with your results is your position. The only way you know that though is, is to see that on the screen, to see that display. Um, if you tried to process that data out and you created a surface, you might still get a surface, but there's no guarantee it's going to be in the right place without checkpoints to verify it. So um, that's another sure. reason we tell people you need control or you need checkpoints because it can look really good in the relative, but in the absolute, it may not be. So, you know, that's exactly. just something I wanted to bring up. But again, as Chris in this demo data set shows us, all is not lost because we can go back to old school photogrammetry, which existed long before airborne GPS and RTK and PPK, and we can still make those corrections from the ground up. So um, that's, that's kind of the final point I wanted to make on the software side, on the demonstration side, um, anything you, else you can think of, David, that might be 
important to folks. I, I like the ability to uh, eliminate the uh, bundle adjustment steps just to, you know, it's, it's like housekeeping. You want to keep your data clean so, um, so the next time you may come back into it, you don't want to confuse yourself. So make sure you clean that stuff up for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the main things uh, that I like that you pointed out. And, um, you know, not everything is lost. Uh, I love that because as myself or even Chris was a licensed surveyor and doing work out there, he thought, you know, this is a complete loss. What happened? Well, our Tiki system is supposed to be the best in the world and it gave me issues. So uh, the fact that he was able to spin out a solution out of that really fast, uh, really made the whole difference, right? Without having to go refly the mission. Um, other things I will point out is when you're working in your, in your AT, uh, once you're done with this process, actually, you know, importing your GCPs, verifying the quality of the solution, um, we have an automated workflow that will create the outputs for you. And um, I'm a kind of a geek when it comes to this. I like to go each step of the way and do my things and do, do basically uh, the manual work. But I understand also that not everyone can be sitting down in an office doing this. So we have an option, which is your third module from left to right, which will allow you to go from A to Z and in one click of a button. And I really like this option because you are able to edit it and you're able to script it, which is something really powerful in Correlator. Uh, moving into how different it is and how powerful it is, distributed processing is one thing that, uh, of course, you guys can see here on the left-hand side. It's not running currently. Uh, I'm on the local, but if I was on a network, I could have other machines to assist in this next part of the process, which is I already completed my aerial triangulation. It looks great. I'm going to take it off. But now I want to create my outputs, which is my, what you guys are seeing here on the screen, my DSM, extract the DTM, or to rectify and finally create my mosaic. Uh, so all these steps can be done by simply hitting process and it will output that. And if I had, uh, again, uh, running in a network of floating license, I could simply select the machines that want to assist in the process and use to task those uh, individual items. So final thing I'll show you guys will be the script that is produced. Um, uh, very simple. Of course, uh, at the same time, very powerful because you can run the script from the GUI or from command and the command line and basically run this and make your necessary adjustments. So again, this is something very useful, something that, that will definitely improve your guys' workflow and make life easier. Yeah, the, uh, the only thing I would add to that is um, I use that often as well. And I might, what I might do is go through the the AT process because you still, again, you have to measure, you have to visually measure your ground control points. Um, yep. So I may leave that out of the script. And then once I get done with that, especially on a project like here, where Chris is probably going to be monitoring this thing monthly or something like that. If you're doing the same yep. thing consistently all the time, um, generate a script that produces the same deliverables every time. And then go through your AT, yes. measure your points. You measure your points and everything's good then just go back and run that script and it'll produce all the deliverables for you. So you don't have to sit here and watch um, the software churn. Uh, and another thing on that is we do now have the capability of, of notifying you every time a step yeah. in the process is done. So when you go through that process, it will send you a text message or an email saying, hey, or AT's done, uh, orthos are done. Mosaic's done, project complete. It'll do all of those things for you. So you, again, you don't have to babysit the software. And you get text messages, right, Eric? You have it from a way that it sends you actually a text message. Yeah, so if you know your provider, so my provider is uh, is Google for my uh, for my phone network, yeah. uh, Fi. Yeah. So um, you do a little research on your phone provider and you have an email address that goes to your text messages um, built in. Exactly. So you can just send it to you as a text. You know, we've kind of left the discussion of RTK and PPK, but uh, <laughs> we've, we've completed the demo and let's go ahead and you can unshare your screen. So uh, again, thanks for the demonstration. Um, everybody, if you've not met them before and you may not have, unless you're calling in for a tech support reason, uh, um, uh, David is always here to help. Um, he will get farther into the weeds than I will. Um, I'm, I'm more the ethereal guy who, you know, I don't know. I mean, you're the master, though. I I, I enjoy I, I'm I enjoy it. 
but I don't necessarily get down in the weeds anymore these days. So um, I'm always coming to David for help as well. We, we bounce things off each other all the time. Um, with that, do you have any closing comments, David? No, first of all, thank you, Eric, for having me. Uh, it's the first one of many to come, I'm for sure. And um, it's great to be part of this team. You are a great source of knowledge. Uh, and um, and so is everyone at this company, uh, all the way from you know our, our founders and owners and everyone who works here. They're just an amazing team. So if you guys want to learn a little bit more about us, just send us an email and we'll for sure spend some time with you guys, either talking and geeking out about technology or troubleshooting yeah uh, so troubleshooting a problem for it, sure it, exactly so it, as we close out our slides up here it's got the contact information for us feel free to reach out to us if you left a question during the webinar believe me we'll respond to it it's just that we're juggling a bunch of things while we're doing this so we will get to you on that for those of you that like to put headphones on and, and uh, listen to podcasts this webinar will be turned into a podcast and available soon. Nice. And it's one of our Pixels and Points podcasts. So I encourage you to, to download and listen to that as well. If you enjoyed the webinar or if you enjoyed the podcast, let others know on social media. We'd always appreciate it. The more we can do to help you work within our software efficiently and get the results that you want, the better off we are. So uh, again, on behalf of David and myself, thank you very much for attending.